Hello scientific people, how are you today? Today we are going to understand the X-ray spectrum and X-ray spectrum is a graph of intensity versus the wavelength for the X-ray photons which are being emitted in the Coolidge tube and intensity meaning the number of photons which are released corresponding to a particular wavelength. So you can see that the graph is continuous as well as there are sharp peaks somewhere and then again the graph continues. So this is a part from this graph and uh, we know that there are two types of X-ray photons, characteristic X-ray photons as well as continuous X-ray photons. Continuous X-ray photons are the outcome of uh, collision between the electrons with the atoms of the anode whereas continuous X-ray photons are the photons which are X-ray photons which are produced due to the transition of electrons between the orbits. So this is a graph for only continuous X-ray spectrum and let us understand what is continuous X-ray spectrum. Let us brief it up because we have already discussed these things. So I suggest that before watching this video you uh, watch a video related to Bremsstrahlung radiations which I had already uploaded in my um, YouTube channel. So uh, briefly telling you that this is an electron coming out from a cathode uh, of a Coolidge tube and this is being accelerated when it reaches the nucleus and during the acceleration we know that any charged particle when it accelerates it actually emits a photon. So this photon which is released due to the acceleration of the electron while uh, moving near to the nucleus. These X-ray photons are called continuous X-ray photons and they are called continuous X-ray photons because they um, emit all type of uh, radiations starting from lambda minimum. Suppose lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4 till infinity. So all these uh, wavelengths would be pro will be uh, there in the uh, spectrum of the uh, photons. So we call it as an continuous X-ray photon and that is why this graph says that we have all the photons present from lambda minimum to infinity. So nothing is absent over here that is why we call this as an continuous X-ray photon. Okay. Now we also cannot ignore the fact that this is an atom of anode tungsten and this is K, L, M and N shell. Suppose we have already discussed this and you can also watch this in the characteristic X-ray spectrum. So we already discussed this that suppose there is a vacancy over here in the K shell and when an electron from L shell falls down to fulfill the vacancy again the difference in the energy will be liberated in terms of a photon and this photon is given the name as K alpha. If an electron from L shell sorry M shell falls down to fulfill the vacancy in the K shell again the difference in the energy will be released in terms of a photon. This photon is called K beta. Suppose if there is a vacancy in the L shell then the electron from the M shell if it comes down to fulfill the vacancy again a photon would be released. This photon is referred as L alpha and suppose this vacancy is being fulfilled by the electron from N shell then again the difference in the energy would be released in terms of a photon. This photon is called L beta and we have already learned that the energy of K beta is highest then the energy of K alpha would come then the energy of L beta would come and finally the energy of L alpha. Right guys? Okay. Now let us understand, let us assume that this K beta has got wavelength lambda 1, this K alpha photon has got wavelength lambda 2, this has got wavelength lambda 3 and this has got wavelength lambda 4. Let us assume that their wavelengths are lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 and lambda 4. So we can see that these lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4 were the wavelengths which were already present in the continuous X-ray spectrum. But additionally we now have more photons corresponding to these wavelengths as well. Right guys? Okay. 
So here in the uh, continuous X-rays, already the photons having wavelength lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 and lambda 4 were present. They were already present. But now due to the uh, characteristic X-rays, I mean the electrons which are being transiting between the following orbits. So K alpha, K beta, L alpha and L beta are also produced. We can also extend our discussion uh, to M alpha, M beta as well but here no need. So we have already assumed that suppose K alpha has wavelength lambda 1, K sorry K beta has lambda 1, K alpha and following. So now we have more number of photons corresponding to these all wavelengths as well. So now what is going to happen over here is that corresponding to lambda 1 there are more number of photons. So here you are going to get a peak. So that is why I have shown a peak over here and corresponding to lambda 2, lambda 3 and lambda 4 also we are going to get peaks. Why? Because more number of photons are released uh, corresponding to these wavelengths, right? Okay. So this is for k beta, this is for k alpha, this is for L beta and this is for L alpha. So why the intensity? or why the number of photons corresponding to k alpha is larger than k beta that is what we are supposed to understand. So from the graph what we can say that the intensity of k alpha is larger than the intensity of k beta and the intensity of L alpha again is larger than the intensity of L beta. So alpha are always going to have more intensity compared to beta. It is because the probability of if the vacancy is created in K shell then the electron from this orbit can also come over here, electron from this orbit can also come over here and the electron from the upper orbit can also come over here. But the possibility of falling of this electron over here would be more so the chances of K alpha photons being produced would be larger. It is because this electron is neighboring electron to this particular orbit. So whatever happens in this shell would be known to this electron first. So the possibility of formation of alpha is always larger than the beta. In the same way over here also the if there is a vacancy in the L shell then the electrons from M shell would definitely jump over here compared to that of the N. N can also come over here but the possibility of electrons coming from here would be larger. So the possibilities of K alpha and L alpha being produced would be larger than K beta and L beta. So suppose if we have 1000 anode atoms of tungsten and if there is a vacancy over here suppose in the K shell. So we have 1000 atoms in which there is a vacancy in K shell. So out of 1000 atoms in 900 atoms the vacancy would be fulfilled by these electrons over here. In rest hundreds, in rest hundred of the atoms the electrons from the upper orbits will jump. So that means the number of photons corresponding to K alpha would be very large and K beta and so on would be comparatively lesser in number. So that is why the intensity of K beta or uh, sorry K alpha and L alpha would be very large. That's why we see a very sharp peak of K alpha and L alpha compared to L beta. But you cannot also ignore the fact that a single photon of K beta has larger energy than K alpha as well. So if you want to conclude we can, uh, we can say that a single photon or single photon for single photon the energy of K beta and L beta would be larger than K alpha and L alpha. But if you talk about intensity which basically means the number of uh, photons, so the possibility of formation of K alpha would be larger than K beta and L alpha would be larger than L beta because the neighboring electrons would fulfill the vacancy first. So hopefully guys you like my explanation and please do subscribe to my channel if you have not done so and thanks for watching the video guys.